Hey, welcome back to Pop Culture Graveyard. I am Hollis, and today I want to talk about one of my all-time favorite bands of the 60s, Love. Love has one of the most varied and eclectic catalogs in all of music, so there's a lot to get through. So let's get to it. Arthur Lee had already recorded some soul bass tracks, including some with Jimi Hendrix on guitar. But once he saw the Birds play live, Arthur was looking to form a band that fused his R&B music with folk rock and later on, psychedelia. Once he secured the services of childhood friend Johnny Eccles on guitar, Arthur shanghaied former Birds roadie slash road manager Brian McLean into being in the band on guitar. Arthur knew that the crowd that followed the Birds would follow Brian to whatever new group he went to. They were rounded out by bassist Ken Forsey and drummer Albin Fisterer, who went by the name of Snoopy. Arthur, Brian, and Johnny were each charismatic enough to front their own band at the time. So it was overwhelming having all that talent in one group. Politically speaking, the group was audacious and revolutionary simply by existing. They were the first integrated rock group on the Sunset Strip. So this was a powerful, sexy band, and that was a dangerous thing to be for the times they were living in. If they were lucky, bands in the 60s got associated with one club. The Birds had Ciro's, The Doors would later have the Whiskey, and Love had a little tiny place called Beto Lido's. They also had the Brave New World, possibly the hippest venue at the time. The band played nightly for months, building up a wealth of new material. The band was soon signed by Electra Records, who up until then were mainly known as a label for folk artists. In March of 1966, the band released Love, the eponymous debut album. Look how unbelievably cool these guys looked. There's Arthur Lee, the leader. There's Johnny Eccles on guitar. And there's Brian McLean, the other songwriter. And we have Snoopy and Ken Forsey in the back. Incidentally, this is the 2017 pressing. It came out in mono, the 50th anniversary of the album. It's fantastic pressing. The only surprising thing about my pressing is that both labels are side two. Wacky stuff like that happens all the time in pressing plants. This album is as refreshing and satisfying as it is uneven. My Little Red Book kicks off the album, which is a fantastic cover of a Burt Bacharach tune that is urgent and primal. Arthur first heard the song in the movie What's New Pussycat, and he fell in love with it. And he went right back to the group, and they started arranging it and worked up their version, which is hectic and incessant and delicious. It became the single off the album and did very well locally. There's a great clip of them performing it on TV. I will put the clip below in the description. But you have to check out Arthur in his super cool fashion sense. The song Can't Explain is a birds-like jangle pop treat, but it has a dark edge to it. It's about letting go of pessimistic thoughts and to stop being combative and how you should do all that before it's too late and you're dead. Trust me, it sounds like ear candy. Message to Pretty is a somber yet bouncy ballad, which is aimed at Arthur's girlfriend at the time, who he nicknamed Pretty. The lyrics go, and I don't need you to help me find my way. I can make it if I just don't see your face. The relationship did not last. Now, this album features the song Hey Joe, which was very popular on the strip at the time. It was made popular by The Leaves, and it was a staple of The Birds' early set, where it was performed by David Crosby. Brian brought the Birds version and its animated arrangement with him when he joined Love, and he would perform it live. It was his showstopper. Brian does a great job on the album version, and it's a nice moment. However, Arthur Lee does not like to be overshadowed, and so he wrote a song on this album called My Flash on You, and he basically stole the music from Hey Joe, souped up the engine, and wrote far more immediate visceral lyrics. It's a stunning, stirring performance, and it's one of the best songs on the album. Furthermore, My Flash on You is the fourth song on the album. You don't even get to Hey Joe until halfway through side two. That should key you in a little bit to the rivalry between Brian and Arthur, both with women and as songwriters. Don't feel bad for Brian, though, because he has a magical moment on this album. It's the song Softly to Me. It's the one song on this album that Brian wrote, and it features beautiful imagery, gorgeously layered lead vocals, and a smart, tight arrangement. Softly to Me is the Brian showstopper on this album that Hey Joe was meant to be. It also perfectly encapsulates Brian's songwriting style, sugary psychedelic lyrics, childlike romanticism, and mouth-watering melodies. 
The next song, No Matter What You Do, is a pretty basic love song, which is elevated by the off-kilter guitar solo Johnny plays, which sounds to my ears almost Velvet Underground-like. You All Be Following is one of my favorite songs on this album. It uses what I'd consider the early Arthur Lee songwriting formula, hard rocking verses and lush, pretty choruses, and it's got that in spades. Signed, DC, is basically a cautionary tale about the dangers of drugs. It's set to music that is basically a quicksand slow version of House of the Rising Sun. Its lyrics concern Don Conca, the DC in the title, Love's first drummer, whose addiction became so bad he had to be ousted from an early incarnation of the band. The album ends on the song And More, which is a simple love song that shows a definite bird's influence. Except the beautiful harmonies on the choruses elevate the song into something else, and it really points towards a looser direction that Love would be moving towards on the next album. In November of that same year, 1966, Love released Da Capo. The band is augmented by Jay Cantrelli on flute and saxophone, and he brings a lot of elements of jazz to this album. By this point, the band really needed a rock-solid drummer, so they enlisted Michael Stewart. But rather than kicking Snoopy out of the band, they simply moved him over to his primary instrument, keyboards and harpsichord. So between Jay's flute and saxophone and Snoopy's harpsichord, this album has a very experimental sound, and I like it. Incidentally, this is a mono version. It came out in mono and stereo. I'm a sucker for mono from bands who came out while mono was king, and mixes were made specially for mono. And so I usually prefer the punchiness of the mono mixes for 60s bands, and this is no exception. But the stereo sounds great as well. This album is really a tale of two sides. And as an entire LP, it really makes for a stunning EP. Side 1 is a great batch of songs. Side 2 simply contains one song. Let's quickly deal with that. The song that takes up all of Side 2 is called Revelation, which is kind of comedic because nothing revelatory happens that whole damn song. It starts out with Snoopy on harpsichord, playing some weird kind of fugue, which is nice. Then the band starts jamming, still nice, and then Nothing happens. It's just a bluesy, boring mess. This was a time when bands were putting one song on one side and sometimes two sides of an album. This was happening, but this track was not happening. No matter how disappointed you and I might be at side two of this album, it's nothing compared to how disappointed Brian McLean was, because he had a batch of songs he would love on that side. Alas. Now, on to the brilliant side one. It kicks off with Stephanie Knows Who. It was written about a girl that both Arthur and Brian were seeing at the same time, and it has a raw vocal from Arthur that's straight off the first album. But the music, especially Snoopy's harpsichord, is eclectic, weird, and wonderful. And it's got a four-way jazz-style solo. The song Seven and Seven Is is the most successful song Love ever released, and with good reason. It's a heart attack of a song. It's got relentless drumming, explosive guitars, and manic vocals. And it ends the only way that an amphetamine dream of a song like that can end, with an explosion. Then there's this lush, almost Richie Valens-like guitar outro that seems like the fallout from the explosion. It's perfectly done. It's a stroke of production genius. The Castle is my song off this album. I love it. It's got Arthur's best vocal performance on this album, in my opinion. It's got Johnny's Spanish guitar flair, which I love. Ken Forsey's bass just ambles at a sexy pace throughout the whole song. Snoopy's harpsichord comes in at just the right moments. It stops, it starts, it's herky-jerky. I love the castle. If Arthur had allowed more songs on side two, and if those songs came even within a hair's breadth of the beauty of side one, we'd be talking about a masterpiece of an album. That's how much I love side one of this album. In November of 1967, the band released Forever Changes, one of the most breathtakingly beautiful musical statements in all of rock. For years, this album jockeyed with Pet Sounds as my favorite album of all time. They still are number one and number two, but I have to tell you, Forever Changes is my number one album of all time. This album was the fulfillment of everything that love had been building towards. It also broke up the band. With this album, Love's experimentation is taken to extremes. There is heavy orchestration on this album. A guy named David Angel did all the arrangements. He worked out the orchestration with Arthur Lee. And like with all perfect albums, the artwork is also perfect. This acid trip of a cover, which is actually supposed to be a heart, believe it or not, 
totally sums up the beautiful trippy music that's inside. This was originally supposed to be a double album, but midway through recording, Electra Records nixed that idea, and with that, all of the Johnny Eccles and Brian McLean compositions that they were excited to get on the album. So Brian became very unruly in the studio. Forever Changes kicks off with the song Alone Again Or. It's a beautiful Brian McLean song. It is sung by Brian McLean, and his vocals are being doubled by Arthur. The song begins with a subdued Spanish guitar that builds in volume and speed until the band and the vocalists explode into the proper song. When Brian heard the final version with the orchestration, he was blown away and he was thrilled. Unfortunately, just before it was mastered, Arthur had the engineers bring up his vocals to the point where they overpowered Brian's vocals. I know Brian only got one or two songs on every album, but that's how threatened Arthur was about Brian and his talent. And it proves he knew what a great song Alone Again Or was, that he wanted his stamp on it. By the way, Arthur did contribute to the song. He added the word or after Alone Again, which kind of adds a bit of mystery to it, and I think is a nice touch. By the way, shout out to The Damned, whose cover version of Alone Again Or was my introduction to the band Love. Though even in my youth, it did sound oddly familiar, so I might have heard the original at some point. You can check out the Damned version below. Alone Again Or is followed by A House Is Not A Motel. The song positively gallops and is brightened by shimmering guitar work. Arthur's vocals alternate between a reserved bounce and an R&B belt. Johnny, by the way, plays two different guitar solos on this, and it's some of the best work he's ever done. Lyrically, according to Johnny Eccles, Janis Joplin brought a Vietnam vet friend of hers over, who was telling the band all sorts of stories about the battlefield, including how blood would mix with mud and turn to gray, which you can hear in the lyrics. Old Man is the second song on this album, written and sung by Brian McLean, and this time we can clearly hear Brian singing solo. It's a beautiful song that's perfect for Brian's fragile voice. I believe it's a love song to the old man who predicted the relationship that the main character is now cherishing. I also think the character later turns into the old man. It's a brilliantly complex song that could not sound simpler. I still don't think people realize what a brilliant songwriter Brian was and how he pushed Arthur and Arthur pushed Brian to create their best work when they were in the crucible of this band together. The two really balanced each other out, and I think they provide nice balance on this album. The song The Red Telephone is a masterpiece. It starts out with a very different vibe in performance than where it ends up. It's also one of Arthur's best vocal deliveries. The song's genesis finds Arthur and Johnny in an art house watching the movie Marat Saad. One of the characters says, we're all normal and we want our freedom. That's stuck in Arthur's head and he wrote an entire song around it that goes in a million gorgeous different sonic directions. The next song, Maybe the People Would Be the Times, or Between Clark and Hilldale, Yes, That Is the Title, is named after a cafe that musicians and fans and hippies would go to at the time on the corner of Sunset and Hilldale called The Eating Affair. Arthur would nickname it The Slop Affair because of how bad the food was, and he mentions The Slop Affair in the lyrics. The horns on this track will force you to rock out. It might be the best example on this album of the orchestration elevating the material. It takes what is essentially an easygoing rocker that wouldn't be out of place on the first album and turns it into a brilliantly funky masterpiece. It also features an eclectic vocal performance from Arthur and he even scats along with the horns at certain moments. The song Live and Let Live begins with the great lyrics, Oh, the snot has caked against my pants. It has turned into crystal, proving that Arthur Lee could make anything sound good. It's a wonderful, whimsical song that creates a sense of dread in the listener. At the exact same time, it bewitches you with its beauty. Live and Let Live also has my favorite electric guitar sound on the entire album. Johnny is so loud here, it almost seems like he's plugged right into the board. And he comes as close to James Williamson's guitar sound on Raw Power as anything in 1967. The song The Good Humor Man, He Sees Everything Like This, is a beautiful ode to morning time, which Arthur sings in a very angelic voice. It was partly inspired by the singer King Pleasure's version of Moody's Mood for Love. And if you hear that version, you'll probably hear the inspiration in Arthur's vocalese singing style. I'm going to put the link below to the original, just so you can see where he got that from. This has got my vote for the most childlike and carefree song on the entire album. 
which is shocking because it was written by Arthur and not Brian. Bummer in the Summer is a song that starts out with some country-style finger-picking by Brian, then morphs into a badass Bo Diddley beat throwdown. It's all about how Arthur wanted a monogamous relationship, but his young girlfriend didn't want to settle down. You know, how rock stars always want to be monogamous. That old chestnut. Bummer in the Summer is a really cool song. Album Ender, You Set the Scene, is perhaps the most epic song on the entire album filled with epic songs. It's the major live concert showstopper, and it's the song that brings down the veil on the album with a master stroke. From a writing standpoint, the lyrics are brilliantly constructed. You go through changes, it may sound strange, is this what you're put here for? So playful. The best line in the entire song, though, is for everyone who thinks that life is just a game, do you like the part you're playing? <laughs> Tell you what, you go ahead, take a little time, and try to write a better lyric. We're waiting. If you're not familiar with Forever Changes and you want to see what all the fuss is about, I implore you to just listen to two songs, the opener, Alone Again Or, and the closer, You Set the Scene. If those two songs don't speak to you, then every song in between won't matter. As I said, this album broke up the band. Several members were dabbling with heroin and other drugs. There was lots of infighting. Jack Holtzman from Elektra offered Brian McLean a solo album. When Arthur found out about it, he fired Brian from the band. The band soldiered on without Brian, but the sound just wasn't the same. And in May of 1968, this era of the band broke up. In September of 1969, Love releases For Sale. This era of love, and every era after it, is simply Arthur Lee and whoever Arthur Lee chooses to play with. Arthur Lee and a bunch of different musicians recorded three albums worth of new original material. And Jack Holtzman at Elektra Records was given those tapes and allowed to pick which songs he would want on the final Love album for Elektra. Jack Holtzman selected the tracks that he felt were the cream of the crop, and it's hard to argue with him. This is a great album, and this is a funky, psychedelic rock band. The bulk of the songs on this album had already been worked on by the Forever Changes era Love, which explains the high quality of the songs. The lead track, August. When it begins, it seems like something straight off of Da Capo, very much like The Castle. Then it morphs into something much more folk-oriented, such as you might hear on the Love debut. Then it goes into Overdrive and sounds almost like an outtake because it was too much of a psych freakout. I hope I'm making it sound good, because it is that. Singing Cowboy is a great track. Robert Montgomery off this is a stellar track. And the album closer, Always See Your Face, is a breathtaking track that is very much worthy of being on Forever Changes. It's that good. And that's really how I, and the entire music industry, for better or for worse, judge everything Arthur did after Forever Changes, is how it stacks up against Forever Changes. Unfair? Absolutely. Nevertheless. Incidentally, this is the 2018 pressing. It sounds phenomenal and it comes on green vinyl, so it's pretty too. So this album I would still call essential. Everything after this album I would not. But if you're a big fan of Love's first three albums, you really need this album as well. In December of 1969, that's right, just three months after For Sale, Blue Thumb Records releases Out Here, a double album consisting of all the songs that Jack Holtzman turned down for For Sale. Arthur's sound got heavier and heavier as he went along. There are more guitars on here. It's much more jammy, and it's much more influenced by the stuff that Jimi Hendrix was doing towards the end of his career. This is by no means as good as the earlier incarnations of love, but with a talent like Arthur Lee, there's always going to be quality on anything he puts out. The songs I Still Wonder and Willow Willow are two of my favorite love songs. And this houses my favorite version of Signed DC, a reworking of the track off the debut album, and it's excellent here. So I highly recommend I Still Wonder, Willow Willow, and Signed DC off of Out Here, if you're curious about the taste of this album. In 1970, Arthur Lee and Love put out False Start. It is very aptly named, and I do not care for it. Moving on, in 1972, Arthur puts out the solo album, Vindicator. This album cover, featuring Arthur and Arthur, is just uh, conceptual perfection. I want you to trust me when I say I've stared at this for hours on end. I can't make anything out of this. But it makes sense to Arthur, and that's all that matters. This is an interesting mix of throwaway songs and timeless classics, with songs like Everybody's Gotta Live, the last truly great Arthur Lee song, 
sitting side by side with songs such as Hamburger Breath, Stink Finger. There are high moments on this album. Every time I look up, I'm down, or White Dog, I don't know what that means. Proving Arthur hasn't lost his sense of humor when it comes to song titles. It's a very Hendrix-inspired number, and I think one of the stronger ones on the album. The track Busted Feet is another strong track. Everybody's Gotta Live is a beautiful, humanistic anthem that deserves to be heard and cherished as much as anything in Arthur's earlier love catalog. This album would be the last album Arthur put out that still had flashes of greatness. In 1973, Love came out with Real to Real. Get it? This came out on RSO Records after Robert Stigwood signed Arthur to a deal. Yes, the Bee Gees guy. Arthur got a real chance here. He was put out on tour opening for Eric Clapton, but due to his drug-induced erratic behavior, the entire deal fell apart. Arthur fell on hard times. He ended up going to prison on a three-strike gun-related offense. Arthur was reborn in the late 90s and early 2000s when he joined forces with the band Baby Lemonade and toured extensively for the first time. I was lucky enough to see them in Manhattan at Irving Plaza and in Brooklyn at Warsaw. A friend of mine was good friends with Gene Kraut, who was Arthur's manager at the time, so I got to meet Arthur both times. He was a very nice man with very, very big hands. Seeing the reconstituted love live for the first time was overwhelming and was a concert of the highest caliber. The Forever Changes concert is amazing. This live set, this is a two disc. Disc one has the Forever Changes concert where they do the full album. Hearing Arthur and seeing Arthur claim all the adulation that was overdue for his body of work is something that warms the heart. So this rebirth of love was a magical time. And I highly recommend that you check out some of the performances. I'm going to put down below their performance at Glastonbury, which finds the band on English soil where they were always revered. And so it's a rapturous response. And the band and Arthur rise to the occasion. So look for that below in the description. If you want a compilation of love, there are some good ones out there. There's Love Revisited, put out on Electra Records back in the day, the early 70s. This pretty much is a best of for people who only want the broad strokes of what love had to offer. There's Love Masters, which takes a number of the best tracks off the first three albums. But if you really, really want to get to know and love love, I highly, highly recommend Love Story. This box set is fantastic. It's two discs and a booklet. It features all the best songs off of all the love albums up to and including Everybody's Gotta Live off of Arthur's solo Vindicator album. So this is exhaustive, definitive, and for the completists among you. And when it comes to love, you could do a lot worse than being a completist. That is it. I hope that I turned you guys on to love if you weren't already there. They are one of the most rewarding listens in all of 60s music. Thanks for joining me this week. Please do me a favor and subscribe and hit that little bell. And I will see you next week with a lot more cool stuff.